Uh, today we're going to talk about fabric sourcing and quality control. <clears throat> so as you can imagine, you know, uh, if you've had me before and all of you had, uh, you know how important uh, good fabric sourcing is and uh, knowledge of fabric and really how important fabric is in general to uh, us as fashion designers. It's our ingredients the same as um, a chef needs fresh and good ingredient, uh, ingredients. Uh, we as uh, designers need good fabric. They're the ingredients to our uh, um, creations. So a lot of time goes into sourcing and quality control for our fabric develop, uh, developments um, for each collection. Now, where um, designers get their fabric can vary, uh, especially uh, on size. Now, larger companies um, will be able to order enough fabric or have need of enough fabric to create a collection to have their uh, fabric uh, woven in a mill. Now, mills will typically only take big orders, so big companies, this is a really great advantage. It's also slightly cheaper working directly with a mill and having your fabric woven uh, is a little bit cheaper than uh, the options available for smaller companies. Um, and again, the more fabric you create, you usually get bulk discounts. So if you're doing a very, very large uh, run uh, of garments, uh, you're probably going to get your fabric at a little bit cheaper than if you're doing a smaller run. So, you know, if you're doing, you need uh, a couple hundred yards, you're going to be paying more per yard than if you need, you know, a few thousand yards. You know, over 5,000 yards, you're going to get a break. Over 10,000 yards, you're going to get an even bigger break, so on and so forth. Your smaller companies, again, aren't going to have the capacity requirements uh, or the, you know, the bulk yardage needed <clears throat> to warrant uh, going to a mill and having them uh, uh, create the fabric just for them. So they'll go through other wholesale providers and distributors and look for fabrics that are really already made uh, that are being sold at wholesale prices. But let's take a look at how we find these uh, connections, how designers uh, connect them. So um, one of the largest places that designers uh, go to to get connected with mills or with wholesale distributors are trade shows. Um, there's a variety of different textile trade shows that aim to connect designers and mills. And many of these trade shows will have a focused theme such as uh, providing a, a, a spotlight on a organic or sustainable fabrics. So let's hop on over to the internet for a second and just take a look at some of these trade shows. So I pulled up a website that uh, basically has a list of trade fair dates, and uh, this is in specific is going to look at textile trade shows. Um, so this is all across America, and you can type in your region or city or date and look for specific trade shows that are going on in the area. Now, unfortunately, this spring, I'm gonna assume that most of them have been closed, um, but in a normal season, there'd be plenty of these going on. And here's just a few of them coming up, or at least uh, uh, still slated to be coming up. We'll see. Uh, we've got Textil, uh, Tex Textil uh, going on here, and you can click on that to look at more. Uh, there's apparel textile sourcing. Um, it, it says it's the largest um, uh, textile sourcing show for southern U.S., so this would be the southern area one. Uh, just popping over here, it says it's for technical textiles and non-wovens. So that would be like your, um, uh, a lot of knits and spandex for like athletic wear. Um, um, uh, and uh, different sorts of maybe vinyls and things, uh, depending on what you're making. Here we have Biofac America. So here's a uh, textile trade show, uh, again, focusing in on organic products, sustainable products, things like that. Um, uh, here we are, the IFAI Expo um, uh, for tex uh, technical textiles. And we can scroll down. These are just the upcoming ones. These are, you know, just more just to show you uh, quite a few of them. Uh, Moda here. So Moda is not necessarily a technical or a, a textile specific. It's really more for a lot of design and accessories and things like that. Just a general industry one. If you guys ever get the chance to sneak into Moda, I highly, highly recommend going. It's super exciting. You get to see all the new fashions. 
Um, it used to be super easy to sneak into things like Moda. You used to just sort of be able to go, maybe have a business card from a place you're interning or working, or make your own business card and sort of just show up and get in. They've recently sort of clamped down on this. Um, again, they're trying to restrict it uh, only to industry insiders um, to you know restrict uh, capacity because lots of people would come uh, that weren't necessarily connected to a business or industry. Just trying to see if they can get some wholesale prices on some new fashions or just to see what's going on. Um, you can still try it. What's the worst they can do? Not let you in? Of course, I'm pretty sure this is gonna be canceled, unfortunately, but next year. Uh, again, uh, as soon as everything stops being canceled. Or, and here we go, Text World. Text World, I have uh, their own website right here. So, um, a uh, so again, yeah, they're potentially thinking about canceling it. But Text World is the largest textile trade show in the New York area, typically held at the Jacob Javits Center. Um, and you can read about it here at their website. Um, it, uh, typically, when, when do they have it? It's happening in the summer. Um, and they'll have lots and lots of booths from mills and distributors all jam-packed into the Javits Center. And you can go around and browse their swatches and um, uh, get prices and uh, listen to seminars about new technologies and things like that that are coming out and revolutionizing um, uh, fabrics, uh, which is a big thing in the fashion industry. Um, you know, textile technology and material sciences are continually uh, moving forward. And new developments that allow designers to do new creative things with textiles um, will always be a big driver of fashion. I remember maybe about uh, 10 or 15 years ago, probably more than that, they revolutionized a way of making these micro-thin uh, uh, suede's. And that spring, all the collections included all these beautiful, very flowing, very sort of featherweight even, uh, suede's that before uh, just simply were not pro uh, possible. And just seeing suede in spring was completely new because it was never possible to create a suede that was light enough, flowy enough, that would really be applicable in a spring collection. So again, we are constantly coming out and scientists are constantly coming out with new fibers, uh, new materials, new chemical treatments um, that uh, will allow designers to use fabrics in a new way and influence the designs. So even if uh, you know, you're not sourcing fabrics, you already have potentially established relationships with distributors or mills, um, there's still great places to go to to keep abreast of all these new developments and technologies that are coming out in the industry. And um, you know, there's lots of things that affect trends. We talked about you know, trend researching. And, but I didn't really talk about you know, um, technological advancements, but that too has a great effect uh, and influence on where trends go and how clothing is made. I'll pop on back to our PowerPoint. Uh, we also have the internet. So obviously the internet is working to connect businesses and designers and mills from all over the world. Um, as uh, can be imagined, it's a great place to do that, especially when distances um, are so great, where uh, design companies may be in one country and the mill that they're sourcing from might be around the world. So many sites are available for designs to search for the right fabrics for the right price. price. So let's go and head on over to the internet again. I have just a couple just as examples, but you can research yourself. Just do a Google search for you know uh, wholesale fabric importers or distributors and you can find all kinds of um, companies that will do that. So here's one, um, uh, high quality textiles. Uh, they seem to specialize in um, sort of dance wear, athletic wear, swim wear, high performance wear. So this is gonna be your spandex and things like that uh, for your yoga pants and you know your workout gear and, and different things like that. So a lot of stretch, uh, uh, I'm assuming, and you can just sort of go ahead and you can uh, look and uh, uh, browse fabrics by category of what you're doing. Um, over here, and you can, you know, all here, they have all this sorts of fun stuff. You can, you know, browse yourself. It's gonna be part of your assignment, so I'll leave that to you. Here's another one, Monopoly Textile Importer of Fine Fabrics. Uh, they're a little bit different. They specialize, again, in wholesale fabrics. They're actually out of LA. Um, they have their own uh, uh, specialties, so they're specializing in, in, in woven solids, laces, 
in prints. So again, every um, company is going to sort of specialize in their own niche of fabric. So depending on how varied or wide your collection offerings are, you may have to go to several places, or if you're doing a very small focused collection, um, you may be able to get all the fabrics necessary from one distributor. Again, really just depends on how big your company is, how varied and uh, wide ranging the fabrics used in your collections are, so on and so forth. I'm going to pop on back here. Now, um, as I said before, there are third party wholesale fabric importers and distrib distributors. You can get in contact with one on the internet or develop your own relation sort of face on face if they're local. Um, and many design companies will choose to work with a third party fabric importer to help with their fabric needs. Now, a lot of these are somewhat different than the ones that I just showed you on the internet. The ones I showed you on the internet have fabrics available already pre-made for wholesale. So there's no fine tuning, um, there's no sort of uh, color control uh, or you know individual creation by the mill for the designer. It's kind of you pick what's there and you buy it from them. Um, however, a lot of these third party wholesale uh, sort of connectors will act as liaisons between the designer and the mill. So we'll sort of oversee your quality control, your production, um, uh, and things like that. And they'll offer those services uh, uh, in addition, it, not actually providing the, fill, uh, the actual fabric because the mill is providing uh, the actual fabric, but they'll also offer those quality control services and a lot of times design development services in addition uh, to connecting with the mill, communicating with the mill, um, and uh, finally producing the fabrics. Actually, in those cases, those companies are very, and also with the, um, uh, the ones I just showed you, are very secretive. Uh, about their actual mill contacts. So if you work with one of these wholesale fabric importers, you may not ever know as a designer what mill exactly your fabric is coming from. The reason being is they provide these quality control services and, and sort of connections um, uh, uh, by working with the mill and then simply charging you a higher rate than the mill charges. It might be, you know, a sort of markup percentage or they may just easily tack on an extra dollar per yard for everything that you buy. Um, and then, so it would be very easy for you once the quality control is sort of completed with the mill to sort of go in and then just purchase directly from the mill as a designer and get that discount that, you know, whatever they're charging knocked off your price. That's why they're very secretive about their contacts. However, a lot of designers still choose to um, utilize them because their knowledge and connections with existing mills is uh, very, very wide and very, very um, uh, 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 detailed and um, thorough. Uh, and then, of course, uh, they will, those services they provide, such as quality control and, and developing the different colors and prints and textures and things like that, um, might just be easier for a design company to outsource uh, than to do themselves. Fabric development. So once we've chosen a mill that we know will probably be within our, our price range and can create, can create uh, the quality and uh, type of fabrics that we need, we need to move on to fabric development. And this will happen for every single collection. And that would oppose you know, our uh, standing uh, relationships with mills, which might be done you know, most intensively at the start of a company uh, when we're initially sourcing our supplies. Um, uh, and necessarily would have to be done, you know, uh, in less frequency than our actual fabric development. Fabric development is done for every collection that comes out. The actual fabric sourcing um, uh, may tweak and, and add a few uh, new mills or new contacts from season to season or year to year, but will not have to necessarily be done for every single collection. So fabric development really uh, involves getting the right fabric. So once a design company has chosen a mill or importer to work with, a series of communications must occur in order to ensure that a designer is going to get the right fabric that has the right qualities. This will include uh, testing and uh, quality checks for feel, color, print, stripes and plaid quality, color, and durability and slash quality. Uh, so what does all this mean and how do we do it? So 
once we have sort of developed our mood board and we know where we're going with a collection of as a designer, it's time to start getting our fabrics. Now the mood board and trend research will lay out the color palette and potentially prints or stripes or patterns that are used. So we have that set too. We just have to make sure that the mill is going to create the right um, colors or prints or stripes for us and also feel. So let's go uh, and look, take a little bit of a look closer in these different areas and see how uh, each one is uh, regulated and checked in this process, this fabric development process. So the first is feel. So in, in order to make sure that the fabric we're being, uh, being produced for a collection has the right feel, or we may call it hand, which basically just means, you know, the feeling of the fabric, um, a large swatch, which is sometimes called a hand loom, or a, swat, a quality swatch card will be produced. Um, the swatch card uh, will typically have a swatch of a slightly larger size for, uh, enable, uh, that will enable you to kind of feel it, um, uh, shake it around, see how it flows, um, see how it touches against the skin, things like that. Uh, with this, designers can kind of get a preview of what the final fabric will feel like. Now, if the designer does not like the feel of the fabric presented in these hand looms or swatch cards, uh, they can work with the mill um, to uh, apply a number of treatments and adjustments um, that can be made. So are there are chemical treatments available that can make fabric softer or shinier or flowier. Um, and I'm not gonna really get it too into those because they're quite technical, but basically once a fabric has been made, they'll either spray or uh, bathe a fabric in certain chemical cocktails that again will make it either shinier or softer, or sometimes flowier uh, and things like that. We can also apply physical treatments like brushing that can make the fabric fuzzier. So when we talk about a treatment like that, like brushing, we're talking about actual literal brushes that are really big, really wide, really flat, and have these tiny little wire bristles. And you brush the top and surface of the fabric to pull up a little bit of uh, fiber uh, to create what's called a nap. And we see this um, uh, with flannel fabrics, sort of most prominently, but can be applied to many other different fabrics to create a kind of soft, fuzzy feeling. We can also apply other physical treatments like sand washing or stone washing, which are pretty much exactly what they sound like. You, watch, uh, you wash a completed woven uh, a section of fabric in sand, and it will kind of um, soften it, uh, make it a, a slightly limper in quality, not quite as crisp, a little bit more flowing, a little bit softer in touch, and things like that. So we'll test all of these different uh, swatches and they'll come back, uh, back and forth until the designer can approve a sort of feel quality that we like um, and move on with that one. Now, of course, color is huge. It is very important to a collection and designers must ensure that all of their fabrics match what is laid out in their mood board's color palette. Now, this can be a lot more difficult than you think it is. Um, it is difficult because different fibers will take dye differently. Uh, for example, a wool might take dye differently than a cotton, will take dye differently than a, a poly. So different dye recipes must be used for different fabrics in, in a collection. Um, traditionally, it was actually very hard to dye things like wool. Um, oh, until relatively recently, I'd say maybe, you know, uh, uh, the 70s, uh, it really wasn't possible to dye natural wool certain colors. Like if you wanted a hot pink wool, you were out of luck. You could not do that. Fortunately, in the modern age, we've developed new uh, chemical dyes and chemical processes that allow us to dye uh, even wool pretty much any color that we want. However, even though we still have this wide array of options and pretty much an infinite array of colors that we can dye pretty much any fabric, we still have to fine tune our dye recipes for each fiber because whatever sort of dye recipe or chemical cocktail used on our cotton fabrics might not be the exact same color as our wool. So we need to fine tune each dye recipe to match our standard colors. And then again, this is important because if I have a wool a sweater that's supposed to be a very specific pink, let's say, in a collection, and I have a cotton that's supposed to be the same pink, 
I need it to be the exact same color. I don't want it to be a slightly different pink or something like that. Of course, if they're slightly different, what's the purpose of making the color palette anyways? The color palette is meant to uh, set uh, strict restrictions on colors used. So we want all of our fabrics to match our color standards exactly. So to ensure color consistency with solid dyes um, or piece dyes, so these are typically um, fabrics that are woven first and then dyed as a whole. Um, uh, they use what are called lab dips to test and match colors. So here in the images, I have a picture of a woman uh, calculating the chemical recipe used in a textile dye formula. And then a, just a rundown flow chart of uh, the dyeing process. So swatches are collected by buyers, uh, sent, uh, or so these sort of, this would be the co uh, collect seller swatch of buyer would be um, the designer sending the mills uh, a, their color palette from the rude board or whatever else, their color standards for the new collection. Based on those colored standard swatches, the mill will create a recipe formula. Um, uh, the dyes uh, will take place, dye testing uh, will take place. Um, they will keep all of the quality buyer requirements. Um, uh, uh, basically, this is, uh, it just means that they're gonna try to match it as closely as possible. Um, that's the buyer requirement is the color swatches uh, match with the swatch again. Then uh, what they're going to do is they're going to create lab dips, which we'll look at a little bit closer in the next slide. Uh, the buyer will look at the lab dips, either approve a dye lot or reject it and send it back with um, suggestions on each one. Maybe say this one needs, you know, 2% more red or 5% more yellow or things like that. They'll try again uh, until you get that buyer approval and then they'll go and uh, use that chemical recipe to dye the rest of the lot. So these are what lab dips look like. They're uh, sort of two different uh, pictures showing lab dips from two different mills. Can sort of just tell that because um, they have slightly different formats. You know, every mill will have a slightly different layout and, and form sheet for their dye lots um, and lab dips, but you know, they kind of all look the same. Now, uh, each one of these is using three, which is kind of the minimum. Uh, depending again on your price point, uh, you're going to want to go with at least three samples uh, with your lab dips. Uh, however, I've seen lab dips with as much as uh, eight to ten different uh, color swatch uh, dye recipes for approval. Um, so basically every color um, in the collection is represented on these swatches. Um, so if we take a look at these, you know, they all look like the same color, but they're all slightly, slightly different because they're used uh, uh, a different chemical recipe or dye recipe is used in each one. And each one is sort of a different attempt to match the color standard. Now what um, uh, a design company will do, if it's a small company or a smaller company, uh, a design assistant or um, uh, uh, you know, a low level employee, uh, not necessarily low level, uh, will look, look, look over these. Now a lot of larger companies will have color specialists that only deal in color coordination. That's their whole job. They help create the color palettes and they also oversee all of the color coordination and quality control. Um, whoever is doing this is gonna take each one of these guys and look at them under a full spectrum lamp. Now these are special lamps made for colorists uh, and utilized in any area where color matching is really, really important. So they're used in jewelry, they're used in interior design, paint matching, um, uh, and of course designers use them as well. Uh, what's special about these lamps is they have a full spectrum light, um, which allow colors uh, to show through a little bit more vividly. So um, I can relate it to sort of a sunny day. If you ever noticed that the sun is really bright and brilliantly shining, uh, the colors outside seem a little lighter, a little brighter, a little bit more vivid than they do on a gray day. They seem a little bit duller and things like that. So these lamps are really meant to match like the light that comes from the sun on a bright sunny day that will allow even minute differences in color uh, to be visible to the color specialists. Now, as mentioned before, if one of these guys matches perfectly, we just say which one. So say we'll take this orange one, I say this, this one right here, this one matches, 
that's the chemical recipe we want. If it doesn't happen, I'll make corrections, send it back to the mill for them to try again, and they'll send me back another set of lab dips. Uh, and basically that process will happen over and over again until we come to uh, the approval of a dye recipe. Now stripes and plaids are a little bit differently because they are uh, colored uh, slightly differently. So as I mentioned before, solid colors, uh, especially for wovens, um, are made uh, or, or colored uh, after they are actually woven. So the yarns are woven in at a, you know, a bleached or neutral color and then they are dyed. Um, for stripes and plaids, and now this is not all, but most stripes and plaids on wovens are what are called yarn dyed. So that means that the actual yarns are dyed before weaving and then they are arranged in particular patterns to create the stripes and plaids that we need. Um, that's why if you look at like woven plaids, um, if you look at like sort of a, a specific plaid where a light color intersects a darker color, you'll get that sort of blend of the two colors, but when a darker stripe and a darker stripe intersect, you get the really vivid color. Um, so because the dyeing is done before, uh, the weaving happens. What will typically happen is a process very similar to lab dips, but they're not sending us little swatches of fabric. They're sending us the yarns, um, sort of look uh, what will look like before. Now the same thing applies where different ri uh, dye recipes are applied uh, to the individual yarns and then sent for uh, approval um, or comment um, uh, and things like that. Now, in addition uh, to our little yarn skeins that we get to test our colors out, um, they'll typically send us a small swatch of the finished woven fabric with the stripe or plaid design that we would like. Now, this allows us to see how the yarns will look in their final version, and we can also make uh, edits to the stripe and plaid design as well. Now prints, uh, as you can imagine, are a little bit more complicated when it comes to color matching. Um, in order to ensure the correct look and color for a printed fabric, uh, a designer will request what's called a strike off. A strike off are small sample print of a, uh, small samples of a print done so a, a designer can approve the color and look of a print for their collection. So again, uh, there's also lots of different ways to create prints. Um, I'm not gonna go into them right now. Maybe we'll do it another day on, on you know, how, how prints are created and all the different methods. Um, but there are many, many different ways to create printed fabric um, from, you know, very uh, uh, old world techniques to very, very um, new uh, techniques. Um, but whichever way your mill is going to create the print, they're gonna create a small uh, um, sample Again, it's gonna be larger than your typical swatch. It's certainly going to include, include at least one, if not several repeats of the print um, and send it to you as, um, of course, what is called a strike off uh, for you to comment on and uh, correct. Um, now you can tweak different things, tweak different um, colors in it, uh, tweak the layout um, once you see it. Uh, things like that until you can get to a print uh, that you can approve for your collection. Now here's just another example over here on the right is um, just another example of a strike off. Um, and here is actually a company um, re uh, strike off request. So this is what uh, a designer um, or third party uh, communicator would send to the mill to request a strike off. So what they're doing is right here, this is not an actual fabric swatch. It is a graphic that they have sent. Now they'll send this on this card and they'll probably send a digital file of that as well. Uh, included, they've sent a color palette of all the colors utilized in the print. And they've also uh, noted what the ground colors will be. Now, when we're talking about a ground color, especially for print, it's the background color here. So, oops, sorry. Oh, how do I go back? Okay. Um, didn't mean to do that. It's the ground color here. This is the background color. So, um, for this swatch, pink would be our ground color. 
black would be our ground color. Dark blue would be, or a blue, bright blue here, and a lighter blue would be our ground color here. So that's just what that means. Now it's also showing um, uh, different versions of what it should look like on the outside and inside of the fabric. Um, uh, so again, this is really just to help uh, the mill try to match this example in this standard uh, uh, as much as closely as possible. And here they're indicating that when they do the strike off, they must include at least one and a half full repeats. So as you know, probably from FD13, uh, prints are done in repeats, which means that we make one small design and then uh, basically repeat it um, uh, over and over and over again to fill up the fabric and we can repeat it in different sort of um, um, uh, brick styles like a grid or a one half slide grid or you know all those different things uh, to create uh, uh, a print. Now knits, um, uh, again, are a little bit of a different story. So uh, knits are done with yarns. Uh, as you know, um, the difference between woven fabrics and knits is woven fabrics are made out of interlock many, many interlocking yarns. However, knit fabrics are made out of one continuous yarn looping amongst itself. So since a singular yarn will be used to knit um, many, many different knit stitches and uh, knit styles, uh, we will get a yarn skein uh, with different dye lots and dye samples, uh, much as I showed you in the example for stripes and plaids, but we'll also include um, small knit swatches indicating the different types of knit patterns intended to be used in a garment. Um, and these are called knit downs, and they provide the designer the ability to sort of edit and approve certain knit designs and textures that are going to be used in their garments. So here we see a couple examples of our uh, knit downs. So here we have a small swatch, and again it's showing this sort of horizontal ribbing, uh, a one by one vertical ribbing, as well, uh, as well as a sort of cable knit and these sort of fancier designs here. Here we're seeing sort of a sample of a cable knit. Here we're just seeing a plain knit with a uh, rib trim. Here we're actually seeing a, a two-tone uh, color pattern. Here we're seeing what is that? It looks almost like a stockingette knit or a waffle knit. It's a little small for me to tell. Um, but again, we're going to try to cram in all the different knit um, uh, textures and patterns that will be used in a collection in these tiny little swatches. Uh, again, for the designer to say, oh, you know, maybe I need this to be a little bit bigger, or maybe I want this to twist three times, or maybe it needs to have a some bigger spacing, uh, and things like that to really sort of uh, uh, fine tune every single aspect of your knit design uh, before it is knitted in bulk. Once all that has been done, uh, you know, uh, lab dips for your solid colors, your knit downs for your knits, your um, uh, uh, yarn dye lots and uh, swatches for stripes and plaids, strike offs for prints or whatever is relevant. Once that gets approved, uh, not even then are we quite ready to go straight to bulk fabric. Now, some uh, companies may, but it's much more often that before we go from sample yardage, we'll go to from these quality control checks um, to a sample yardage. So the sample yardage is a smaller yardage than uh, the bulk production will be. However, the sample yardage, the exact amount, uh, will depend on the company. Smaller companies may just need a few yards. Uh, larger companies will need potentially hundreds of yards. Um, and this is really, uh, will be determined by how many sample garments they intend to make. Um, so if you remember, our sample garments are used to sort of uh, uh, test and provide um, uh, samples of the co collection. So if we're making many, many samples, pot potentially for sample sales and things like that, we might have to get, you know, a couple hundred yards uh, for a sample yardage. If we're just creating sample yardage uh, or sample garments, to fill out a, yard, a line sheet or something like that, we may just need, um, you know, several yards uh, of each fabric used. 
Um, and again, this is going to give us one last step of uh, seeing how the fabric will perform um, in a finished garment. So because our sample garments will be made out of this sample yardage, we get to see how the fabric sort of falls, feels in a real garment, comes together, and really handles um, when it is put into the finished garment. Now, if there are any additional changes that need to be made based on, again, how it performs in the sample garments, they can and still, uh, they will and can still be implemented, implemented before the bulk production. So again, we don't jump the gun and go straight to bulk production because then we'll end up with, you know, 5,000 yards of a fabric that has an issue with it. But once we do get through sample production, um, and everything works out okay, and there aren't any more um, things that we might need to change or alter or, or test through, we will go through with bulk production. Um, uh, and again, this is the fabric uh, that will be sent uh, directly to a garment factory after it's made um, or bought uh, to produce the final looks of a collection that will be sold in stores. Um, down here again, we have a mill uh, creating fabric uh, from fiber, uh, that will be sent out uh, to a garment factory. And we base this bulk production order on the um, orders for garments that we have got gotten in. So again, once those sample garments are made, we're able to create line sheets, um, uh, go to trade shows with our collections, uh, so on and so forth, and get an idea of how many garments uh, will need to be made uh, to fulfill our orders from retailers or from clients and uh, different things like that. So we use that information, uh, say, okay, I need, um, you know, I, I know that 500, uh, you know, orders of this uh, dress are going to be needed, okay? The 500 dresses need to be made. Um, they utilize three yards of fabric. Um, uh, so that'll be 1,500 yards that need to be ordered, so on and so forth. And we'll do this for every garment that is, or every fabric that is needed um, uh, to be produced uh, within our collection. And here again, we have our uh, factory down here and a purchase order with uh, that, you know, every mill um, or distributor are gonna have their own order forms and things like this, but we can see here that someone is ordering um, uh, about 12,000 meters, which is close to a yard. This is just a, you can tell by the unit price, they're an English designer, so they use meters instead of yards, but it's, it's pretty close. Um, so they're using, they're buying 1,200 of this viscose, a printed spun viscose, um, as their uh, bulk order, and they have some bulk details down here too. Um, test report must be provided without fail. Uh, you must send a uh, five uh, meters uh, from the bulk batch uh, to ensure color continuity, uh, continuity. So that's not rare. Lots of times uh, certain amounts of yardage will be uh, requested to be sent uh, to the designer um, uh, for sort of quality control um, and, and, and their own testing, uh, so on and so forth. Now we're gonna get into testing right next in our section of quality control. So we've already gone through a bunch of quality control checks for fabrics uh, pre-woven, but we have uh, another series of checks post uh, bulk production. So bulk production fabric quality. So after the bulk yardage for a collection has been woven, but before it gets cut and sewn, and often either during the time it's being shipped to a garment factory or before it is being shipped, it will go through third-party testing to ensure overall quality and durability. A sample of the bulk yardage is sent and will be tested, and it's usually tested at least once by a third-party inspector, but it's also usually inspected in-house or by the mill itself, and uh, sometimes, although so uh, rarer, will be des uh, tested by the uh, designer uh, themselves. So the bulk yardage is typically tested at least once, again, by the third party, um, probably a second time in-house by the mill, and um, most rarely, but it does happen a third time by the actual design company. 
Um, Intertech is one of the leading fabric testers in the world. There are many companies that do third-party testing, but Intertech is one of the industry standards. We're just gonna take a little peek at their website. So here's their website, and a lot of what I have down here that talks about everything that they test for, um, uh, different standards, um, so it's, uh, again, if you've never sort of done any of this or are um, uh, used or, or um, uh, knowledgeable about any of these testing uh, procedures, uh, it's, it's interesting to just sort of go through uh, and take a look at this website to see sort of, you know, what people get done, what they're looking for, um, so on and so forth. And there are lots of different, again, third-party testers. Uh, Intertech is just one of the major ones. So um, here's an Intertech uh, fabric test report. So the uh, yardage will be sent again to Intertech or another third party, uh, and they'll test a variety of different aspects of the fa uh, fabric. Um, these are pretty much what they look like. You can kind of peruse them. You can sort of see, you know, the different results, requirements, uh, standards. So um, what will happen is the fabric will uh, test different aspects of the fabric. Uh, the designer and the mill have agreed to certain standards. So uh, say, you know, tensile strength that has to be this strong, color change, it has to go through at least this amount of washing before we um, uh, see color changes. And those um, sort of standards are agreed upon um, in the order contract between the designer and the mill. So the mill has to contractually uh, meet these standards. Um, uh, and this is again why testing is so important. Um, we get to really see if the mill is providing us with fabric with the quality that we desire and that we have contractually agreed upon. So what aspects of a fabric that get tested will depend on the design company and the intention of the garments. So again, every design company is gonna have different needs from their test results and different needs from their fabric. So just for example, a company selling really high performance technical garments, like garments that are made for like outdoor survival um, or even you know dance uh, uh, garments that are made to uh, need to hold up to vigorous movement and stretching over a long period of time, um, or work garments, so garments made um, uh, for workers that are meant to be strong and tough and durable. Um, they will be uh, um, subject to much more rigorous testing and uh, demand much higher quality standards. Companies selling kind of low performance clothing, you know, like your cheap sweatpants that all you're going to do is sit around and watch Netflix in, kind of like, I guess, what we're all doing these days, um, uh, especially at lower price points, will have lower standards and require more minimal testing. Again, because they are not high performance. They don't have to um, hold up against uh, different things like, you know, movement or durability or color safe. And again, you can see... Um, with really high performance things and the intent of the garment, just how important some of these uh, fabric tests are. So say you are designing a really high performance um, outerwear uh, for, you know, a, a technically specific, you know, an outdoor company, maybe REI or, or, or North Face or something like that, where, you know, people are gonna be buying this outerwear in hopes that they don't freeze to death when they go up on the mountain. So, of course, you're going to have to test for things that, you know, um, other things aren't going to need. Those outerwear that need to keep you warm and safe when you're mountain climbing are going to have to go through a series of, you know, insulative tests to see, yes, they can keep you warm. Yes, they can uh, um, perform even wet. Um, uh, they can cut wind. Whereas if you're just making graphic tees with you know a design logo on it, just meant for casual wearing, you don't need to do all of that extensive testing. 
So even though what is going to get tested will vary greatly depending on the company and the intent of the garment, some of the general things that get tested are listed here. So fiber content. So the fiber content of a fabric will be tested to ensure that it is what the mill has promised it to be. It's a series of chemical and uh, very highly scientific tests that um, will guarantee you if the um, mill is selling you 100% cotton something that it is indeed 100% cotton. They're not sneaking any poly in there to kind of um, uh, uh, cheap out on the price or anything like that. And this, of course, is important because this will be used in the labeling of the final garment. So you got, if you guys have uh, uh, probably noticed, in each one of your garment, there is a content listing um, that is legally required to be there. And again, you are responsible not only for it being there, but for it being accurate. And having a third-party tester um, uh, tell you without a doubt the content um, will help you greatly in accurately creating your content labeling for your garments. The testing can also help in care instruction labeling. So in addition to our content labeling, we typically will find care instructions, which might say dry clean only, or uh, wash in cold water, or um, uh, so on and so forth. So um, when we're testing our garment, we will uh, test its color fastness. So again, how many times do we wash it? Um, in what you know, um, uh, temperature do we wash it? Uh, uh, does it lose its color faster in hot water or cold water? Um, can we bleach it? Uh, what does dry cleaning do to the color and to the quality um, and things like that? Also, dimensional stability. So, um, you know, uh, should we be washing this by hand with you know uh, being gentle with it? Can we can we put it through a high spin on the washer? Um, or will it warp like crazy uh, when we do that? Can we hang dry it instead of putting it in a tumble dry? Should we tumble dry low? So all of these different things are uh, basically washed and all these different um, uh, um, aspects, all these different options that we have when washing to see how the garment will behave. And it will, um, in the end, we will apply that information to our care labeling. So if we find that dry cleaning will um, uh, be best for this type of garment, we'll label dry cleaning. If we uh, note that it can basically be washed as normal, just the temperature has to be cold and it should be hung dry instead of uh, machine dried, uh, we'll include that um, uh, based again on their test results. We'll also do a bunch of physical testing, uh, color fastness to light. So again, um, as you probably have noticed sometimes, bright light can fade colors over time. So how quickly will uh, bright light and sunlight uh, fade the dye colors? Um, uh, we'll rub it to see if it will snag. Uh, we'll rub it to see if it will pill. How quickly will it pill? So what is pilling? So a lot of times when uh, knit fabrics or um, uh, like flannels or something that has a bit of a nap or a fuzziness to it, those fuzziness will kind of um, clump together in what's called a pill. Um, it's, you know, we also have uh, what's called fabric shavers that we can sort of shave fabric to get rid of these pills. But high quality fabric will um, pill uh, in lower frequency and lower um, uh, frequency uh, than high quality fabrics. Also strength, so little machines will pull the fabric apart to see what sort of force is needed um, uh, to get the fabric to tail, tear. So again, if we need really strong fabrics, we're gonna be uh, looking for really uh, high tensile strength, and that is when we pull fabric, um, uh, its strength is how much you know force can it hold being pulled apart before it tears. Um, uh, abrasion, so we'll have little machines uh, like this one here that will rub and rub and rub and rub and rub and rub and rub the fabric until it starts to wear away. And depending on how many rubs it takes to start to wear away, that's a higher quality fabric. Um, if it starts wearing away pretty, pretty short after the beginning of the abrasion test, it's fairly weak. Um, and again, this one um, is pressing it to see how uh, uh, it can be squished. It will, it will hold up to being really squished and pressed really tight um, uh, and different chemical tests and things like that, uh, final pH, 
uh, and things like that will be done. And these are typically done for all fabrics. And again, some fabrics might be uh, uh, more tested, some might be uh, less tested. Now, you may ask, what happens if it doesn't pass the test? Well, in sort of the best world, um, you would imagine the entire lot is rejected um, and they start over and uh, adherence to quality standards are always met. Now, this may be the case in our very uh, high performing garments. Again, there is a lot of liability when you need a garment to really perform um, uh, under stress, whatever that stress may be. Um, and in those situations, if it doesn't pass the test, yeah, the entire bulk lot will be scrapped and they will start again. And again, those, that will be outlined in the contract between the designer and the mill. So that will be on the mill. The mill could not meet the contractual uh, fabric standards. So it will be created again to meet it um, a bit, uh, at their cost. So there is a lot um, of incentive on the mill's part to meet these uh, um, quality standards. Um, and again, that is specifically for companies creating high performance garments that need to absolutely need to perform. I mean, can you imagine if uh, you know we were a garment um, a producer creating uh, uh, uniforms uh, for firemen, and you know we decided to just go ahead with a bulk order that didn't pass the testing on insulation? We would have some very angry, uh, very burnt firemen. Uh, coming after us. It would be, you know, very negligent and irresponsible on our part. However, most fashion companies do not have this sort of high performance need. Um, obviously, you would think, oh, well, luxury markets, they are high price points, so they want high quality fabric. Well, yes, but no one's really going to get burnt if that fabric doesn't perform. In fact, it's not really going to do anything. It's just going to fall apart faster. Um, and so a customer may or may not um, buy again from them. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, what happens when these um, fabric requirements aren't met in testing is um, the fabric uh, or the um, design companies will negotiate with the mill for a lower price on the fabric. So it will not get scrapped. The bulk order will not get re, uh, um, remade. Now, why in this case would a fabric company reject the offer um, of remaking a bulk lot at the mill's cost? It doesn't seem to make sense, right? Uh, it doesn't cost the fabric company anymore. And if they have already um, contractual agreements as to fabric quality and standards, it would have to be the mill's cost. Well, this comes into timeline. Um, remember that everything was due yesterday. If um, it gets to the point where a, a fabric company has to remake the entire bulk production, it could delay the start of garment manufacturing by a week or more. Um, and that could delay the shipment to stores and clients and retailers again by that same amount of time. And um, design companies and garment manufacturers will do anything to prevent this. Uh, this is because if you're late in your shipments, um, all of your retail clients and stores and customers are gonna start wanting refunds because they have due dates or, and deadlines uh, as to when they are promised to receive their product. So therefore, most design companies, when faced with substandard fabric uh, results, uh, will simply negotiate with the, will, the mill for a refund uh, on the actual bulk port purchase. So for example, say I'm you know, your average fashion company and a, the mill produces a fabric for me that fails in tensile strength. Um, we have contractually agreed to a certain standard for tensile strength. Um, since it failed, um, 
what I'm going to do is say, hey, you didn't meet this requirement. I want, oh, a 10% discount per yard. And again, this is much better for most fabric companies to do. It, it keeps us on schedule. It gets us a discount. Um, in the end, it lowers the actual qual uh, um, quality of our product. But honestly, in today's market, the clientele knows so little about fabric quality that it doesn't really matter. In fact, most quality standards are there just to try to get discounts from the mill, um, not to please the customer. I know it sounds pretty cynical, but I mean, it's true. Uh, uh, garments today, for the most part, in most uh, 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 people's needs, don't really need to be that high performing and don't really need to be uh, that long lasting. Um, what with fast fashion, it's really gone the other way. It, uh, clothing has sort of uh, uh, dropped to the bottom of the barrel quality to be able to be offered at such low prices. Um, so that's what happens, um, you know, sort of two different alternatives of what happens when uh, our tests fail, um, our fabric testing fails. Um, that ends our, basically our uh, little overview of quality uh, and fabric sourcing. Um, hope you enjoyed it. Uh, we have assignment to go along with it. Let me pull it up. It's so this is your assignment number four. It's for fabric sourcing. And you are going to play the role of a designer trying to source fabrics for their new collection. The fabrics chosen must be of the right quality and for the right price. Uh, of course, because you will be working within a specific market and price point. And of course, fabric is one of the most important factors when it comes to um, pricing a garment. So we have to make sure that we're going to be in a good price point for our fabrics. Um, you're going to research online fabric importers and wholesale distributors for fabric to build a collection based on a specific market and price point. Now you'll have greater access to different um, fabric wholesalers online. Uh, because of course you can just go to their sites now a lot of them will require you to ask for a quote so you might have to do this you might have to reach out to them and ask them to quote a specific amount please do not ask for the price of a yard remember that these are wholesalers so they will simply just trash your email instantly if you want to get their intention please ask them to quote at least 500 yards um, to get an accurate price point. And again, think about who your designer is or who you are as a, a designer, what your customer is gonna be. Is it gonna be a very big collection? Is it going to go out uh, on a very sort of mass scale or is it gonna be sort of a smaller boutiques type of deal? That will influence how many yards you will need. So again, if it's a smaller boutique collection that you wanna get, maybe you're only gonna get 100 to you know 500 yards. If it's a big mass, um, if you work for a big company and you're imagining that you work for a big company, you might need upwards of 1,000 yards. Um, it's gonna be up to you. So um, if you consider you know some big company like Ralph Lauren, um, if they know they're going to use a specific fabric for um, uh, shirts and, and maybe even a dress or maybe a couple garments are going to use this fabric in their new collection, they may order upwards of 10,000 yards of that fabric. So um, try to figure out you know, what amount of fabric because that will also affect the price that is quoted to you. Now if you want to go out and uh, look at some fabric wholesalers um, that are open now, I know Mo Mood has a wholesaler division. Um, just please wherever you go, um, make sure that you're getting wholesale prices. I want you to understand the difference between wholesaling and re re uh, retailing. So, you know, mood basically, if you're not in a giant warehouse with floor to ceiling racks of bolts, you're not in the wholesale section. Um, so, if you are going to go out and uh, try to look at some wholesale fabric uh, distributors within the city, uh, don't tell them that you're a student, don't tell them that you're working on a project. Um, they don't want to help you. What they want to do is sell large amounts of fabric. So say you are an intern or a designer yourself, 
um, looking to, for to quote some prices for a new collection. Um, this way they'll help you um, if they think that you know you actually are going to come back and buy 500 yards of fabric. Um, if you tell them you're a student, if you're if you're truthful, so you might have to be a little, you know, not so truthful with this to get someone's help. But uh, any way you want to do it, um, just try to get the best information that you can and the best quotes that you can. Uh, once you have your fabric, you're going to create a list of the fabrics that will be used in your collection, ones that you have sourced. Include all available information such as fiber content, weight, price, uh, their, where they came from, so their source, etc. So please be as um, descriptive as possible. So, you know, if I see a swatch and next to the swatch the information is cotton and nothing else, I'm not going to be too happy. Um, what kind of cotton is it? Um, you know, is it poplin cotton? What's the weave type? Is it 100 by 100? Is it uh, two ply yarn? Is it, um, <clears throat> you know, what's the weight of it? Is it, because there's lots of different sort of weights of poplin. Um, I want all of these different things. Um, the price, of course, where you got it, of course. So be as descriptive as possible. Copy and paste your images of your fabric alongside their information. So again, just like before, fiber content, weave, uh, weight, price, etc. Um, if you visited fabric stores, um, you're going to take pictures of your swatches and arrange them next. Uh, arrange those pictures next to their information. Um, so again, this depends on what you do. If you work with the websites, you can just copy and paste their images um, as your your list, your source list. If you visited the stores, you'll have actual swatches, um, which in the industry is, is what we do. We would never just take images of fabric and use it as a fabric source. We always use swatches um, because we like to feel it and we like to see how it drapes in person. But of course, you know, what with everything, uh, images will be fine for this assignment. Along with every fabric, um, describe what garments will be used to create uh, it will be used to create in the collection. So every fabric, you'll have an idea of what type of garment um, or style of garment is going to be made out of that fabric. So list what that would be. Include a brief outline on why you selected the fabrics you did, what price point you were working with, what market you chose, and how your chosen fabrics need to perform in the collection. So what do they need to do? Do they need to keep someone warm? Do they need to be durable? Do they need to be comfortable? Um, what do they need to do? Do they need to create shapes? So do they need to be stiff and full um, to create a you know voluminous silhouette? What do they need to do? Okay, so once that's all done, you'll hand it in to me, just like this. And good luck, and stay safe, and happy learning.